Well, hello again. Welcome to the class uh, entitled The Kingdom of God is Like. This is lesson number three in this uh, series. And the title of this lesson is Farming in the Kingdom of God. Farming in the Kingdom of God. And if you have your Bibles, I'll be reading out of uh, 1 Corinthians. So open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter three and we'll go there in a little while. Well, like uh, Jesus, uh, Paul used many illustrations to explain the inner workings of God's kingdom and the spiritual world. Of course, uh, Jesus used parables to explain all of this. And Paul also uses uh, an analogy, a farming anal analogy to, uh, to explain uh, how things work in the uh, kingdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter three, he begins by comparing working in the kingdom of heaven on, uh, on earth which is the church, to uh, working on a farm. I think the reason he does this is to help us understand in a practical way what our ministries in the church actually mean in relationship to the, in, in relationship to the big picture, okay? Uh, it's easy to become frustrated and discouraged uh, in our ministries if we don't see how what we are doing in a specific area uh, fits into the whole. Um, that's why smart companies uh, give their employees uh, orientation training in the goals and the overall operation of their businesses so that the individuals can see the place and importance uh, that their contribution makes to the final product. You know, you're, you're over here working on the floor of the production plant and what you do is connected to all of this and, and, you know, and all of this uh, produces a product, uh, uh, a final product which we sell and which supports uh, all the families that, that work here. So it's always nice to know what part you play in the, in the bigger picture. Well, Paul is doing this very thing in 1 Corinthians chapter three by explaining the, the overall cycle that must take place in the normal development of a church. In doing so, he was hoping to dispel feelings of pride or despair felt by various individuals because they happen to be you know, at the, some high point or some low point in the normal cycle of church growth. Uh, he chooses the farming illustration to explain this because his readers would easily understand this uh, imagery since farming was the oldest of the cycles uh, known to man. And of course, it was an agrarian society uh, at that time. So uh, with the farm model, he explains the natural evolution of growth in the church and how each plays an important part for that growth uh, to take place. So let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter three and begin by reading verses one to four. Paul writes, and I brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able uh, to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not mere men? And so he begins uh, this section by rebuking his readers for their immature attitude. Uh, he compares them to spiritual babies who are not ready to begin eating a regular diet of spiritual food. And the reason for this rebuke is that they are jealous of one another's, uh, uh, jealous rather of one another and are dividing into separate groups, calling on different individuals in the church to, to be their leader. Paul says that in doing this, they were worse than spiritual babes. They were mere men or they were unspiritual men or they were uh, men without God's spirit. Quite, quite a severe uh, rebuke. Now the reason for their jealousy and division was that they were aligning themselves with different church leaders and they were claiming that their work and their success was their own. Uh, a little like you know, uh, Texas and OU, you know, football, uh, there's a great rivalry there. I, I always uh, kind of smile when I, 
uh, see a game and, and they talk to the fans and whoever wins, let's say Texas wins, you know, and they say, yes, we did it, we won. And I'm asking myself, you know, what do you mean we did it, we won? You didn't do anything. You sat up in the stands and ate a hot dog while you watched the game. It's the guys out in the field that actually played and won the game. But nevertheless, there's this uh, victory by, um, by association. Well, uh, the same type of thing was going on in the, in the church. Uh, people were aligning themselves with you know, various leaders in the church, uh, claiming that this group was stronger, was better, was right on certain issues, was more productive. And that of course call, caused partisanship, partisanship breeded division in the church. And so in response to this partisanship, Paul explains the true role of these people as equal servants in a cycle of growth that begins and is maintained by God. So in explaining the tasks that he and Apollos, who was a great orator and preacher of that time, in explaining the tasks that he and Apollos uh, uh, had, Paul establishes a model for all future workers to refer to when comparing what they are doing to the overall work and growth of the church or the kingdom, right? We use those terms uh, interchangeably. So we read in verse five, he says, what then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. And so he says that all workers, regardless of their task or where they are in the cycle, are all equal uh, because uh, uh, all of them are working towards the same end which is producing faith in Jesus Christ in the hearts of others. So the planting and the watering and the harvesting, all of this is working towards the same objective. Everybody in the circle, everyone who is serves, no matter what point in the circle they are, they're all working towards the same goal, which is faith in Jesus Christ and to engender faith in Christ and in, uh, in other people. Uh, so therefore no worker can boast since the opportunity to serve, the tools to serve with, and later on he's going to say even the results are all provided by God. No servant therefore can boast because all begin with nothing and all are completely supplied for the task by God. By implication, Paul is telling his readers that if he and Apollos cannot boast, then neither can their so-called followers boast. Let's keep going, verse six. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So in verse six, he applies the cycle found in the farming and gardening uh, activity to the cycle of growth that we experience in God's kingdom here on earth, which is the church. He mentions three phases in that cycle and the fact that each one represents a place and a type of work that we find ourselves in as Christians serving in the church uh, for the Lord. So the first step in the cycle is planting. There's no crop without first the seeds being sown into the earth. Now in the church, Sowing of seed or planting is essentially spreading the gospel to all nations. Proclamation of the gospel is always first, always. This Jesus alluded to in the parable of the sower and the seed. As, the, as a matter of fact, he even said in verse 14 that the sower sows the word by way of explaining the parable to his, to his disciples. Now the Lord also made this to be his basic command as the first task of the apostles after his resurrection. Mark 16, uh, 15, what does he say? You, 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 you go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. So whether you're beginning a church or you're helping a church reboot or restart or you know, recommit, proclamation is always first. You always start with the planting, uh, planting of the seed. Now there's a lot of ways to do this uh, seeding in today's uh, church. Uh, missionaries who go into foreign countries, uh, advertising or correspondence courses, radio, television, and of course more recently the internet, uh, uh, VBS, sojourners. These are all tools, you know, for what? 
for, for, for seeding, for planting, uh, 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 visitation programs, uh, the list goes on and on. Every effort to bring the gospel to those who haven't heard it before is part of the planting effort. Now, planting is hard work. It's uphill type of work, type of effort. You need, you need great faith in order uh, to be a planter. Uh, and, and you need to be able to work with uh, very little encouragement and you need to be ready not to receive too much credit for, for what you've done. It's usually lonely kind of work because you labor with a hope and a vision that only a few other people can see. Uh, Abraham, for example, and Noah and, and the apostle Paul, they were seed planters and they set an example for modern day seed sowers. You know, even in our own congregations, we have older members who are simply seen as the golden agers by the young people in the church. You know, ah, those are the older folks, you know, all they do is they have a golden age dinner once a year and they go on bus trips, you know. But a lot of young people don't realize that many of these senior saints were the very ones with the, with the zeal and the faith at the beginning as young men and women uh, to buy the land and build the building that everyone is now using. We forget about that. Of course, the reward for visionaries is a faith that is rock solid as a result of the vision they have received in serving the kingdom. In the end, the planters, the sowers, the visionaries, uh, they feel closer to God and are continually and easily filled with awe and praise as we see in Paul's writings where he spontaneously breaks out in praise and joy, even in the most difficult of circumstances. So this is the true spirit of planters, of those who, who sow seed. Another uh, work is watering. Paul claims that Apollos was a waterer, a nourisher, a builder upper. Uh, this is usually the longest stage in the cycle of farming as it is in the cycle of church growth. The seed is planted by hard work to break up the soil and remove the debris. Then the farmer waits patiently for the rain to nourish the seed and the earth. In the church, this watering stage involves uh, organizing and ministering to other people or persevering in a task. It involves uh, teaching and Bible study year in and year out. It's the task of building buildings and training teachers and helping ministers to mature. Watering also includes the work of strengthening families and developing leaders and establishing good community relationship. Now we know that planting is hard, but watering is tedious. It's slow, it's grinding, sometimes it's uh, repetitive and monotonous over and over and over again. We do the same things, right? It's discouraging at times because it is often a case of you know, one step forward, two steps back. Uh, there are many late nights, uh, many large responsibilities and sacrifices and not much gratitude from your students at the time. People like Solomon, who consolidated David, his father's gains, and later spent decades building an elaborate uh, temple. You know, he spent decades uh, doing this. We, we want the building program to be finished in three months. You know, we, we don't realize the work that goes into these things at times. Barnabas, the, uh, the early mentor of Paul and later Mark, he was a waterer. The apostle John, who had little movement in his ministry, but remained a long time in teaching and building up the church in Ephesus and in Asia Minor. You know, we have these kinds of servants today. For example, elders who serve with their wives and, and keep a steady hand for years. Uh, uh, deacons who work hard with little recognition. Uh, teachers and ministers who are there day in and day out to the point that we take them for granted. They're always there when we need them, right? But that means a, a person has to have a persevering heart and spirit in order to be that steady. Uh, uh, these brothers and sisters who are responsible for a thousand acts of kindness in visiting the sick and preparing food and serving in childcare, they are the quiet waterers that continually nourish the church. 
Now, I, I've not mentioned all who deserve to be mentioned, only a few to, to help you understand the kind of person and the kind of work that watering is. The reward for waterers is that their work etches into their character over time and you begin to see the true markings of hope and strength and the most precious virtues, uh, that of uh, godly uh, humility. Waterers feel close to God's people and they know his ways intimately. This gives them a great confidence for the future and a hope that cannot uh, be shaken. And then we have uh, uh, the cycle, part of the cycle, which is the, the harvesting part. Third part, as we said before in the, in the cycle is harvesting. Jesus promised that those who are faithful to sow seed and to work the soil, they will have a harvest of some kind. Sometimes, sometimes 30, sometimes 60, sometimes a hundredfold. You know, people, a lot of times people, uh, uh, you know, ministers, uh, elders, deacons, you know, they get discouraged because they tried real hard and they, they, they don't get a hundred percent return on their effort. You know, they, they get a 30 fold or they get a 60 fold and they forget that Jesus even tells us that those who work, you know, planting the seed and watering and waiting for the harvest, sometimes the harvest is only a 30 fold, sometimes 60, sometimes 100. You know, sometimes you have a, a knockout success with a program or with an idea or an effort that you make. Sometimes a, a mission work or a mission trip that you thought would bring a lot of success uh, does not succeed as well as you had hoped. That doesn't mean that everything is a failure. Jesus tells us it's a cycle. You plant the seed, you water, and then you wait for the harvest. And sometimes the harvest is 30 fold, but sometimes it's 60 and then sometimes it's 100 fold. But there's always a harvest. That's the, that's the important thing that we have to remember. So uh, the work of harvesting includes baptizing souls who are coming to Christ, especially in, in third world uh, countries. Uh, managing the growth caused by years of work by other people. Work like operating Christian schools or writing books or organizing great demonstrations of praise and public worship. Uh, planning for the next plateau of growth in large congregations. That's the work of harvesting. Uh, funding other good works to glorify God and to edify the church. Harvesting, of course, has its own unique set of challenges. For example, you are the steward of the hard work of other people and receive many times little credit for what you accomplish, or you are judged and compared to others who came before you, or you have to cope with new problems that have not been faced before. People like Joshua, who took over from Moses and settled the land, already subdued by others, was one who worked a harvest period. And Peter, along with the other apostles, enjoyed a great harvest from Jesus' ministry, but they had the task of leading the early church through the first difficult years of its existence. Today, many of you, uh, present elders and deacons and ministers are very much into this phase as you strive to find the direction and you know, new goals to reach based on the achievements of others in the past. Of course, there's a reward for harvesters as well. Uh, their task is, is a joyful one and they have many resources to work with and they have the blessing of seeing God's power at work they're seeing a harvest. That's a great faith builder when you see the harvest coming uh, from those who planted and those who watered. Harvesters, they get an early taste of heaven and they experience the pleasure of having a thankful heart. So now that we've you know, had a kind of a bird's eye view of this model of growth, let's draw a few practical lessons, shall we, for our own situation here today. As we follow in Jesus's footsteps in doing the work of the kingdom as planters or waterers or uh, harvesters, a couple of things to remember. Remember number one, church growth, church work and growth is cyclical in nature. 
No one person and no one congregation is exclusively in one place. In other words, every church you visit is somewhere different on that cycle of, uh, of church growth. We go from one stage to another in our personal ministries, as well as the development of a congregation. Uh, knowing this helps us not because, uh, excuse me, knowing this helps us not become too proud or too discouraged or, 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 or get into a rut. If we remember, this is a cycle. This is where I'm at in the cycle. This is what I am doing in the cycle. And uh, if I'm a little discouraged, if I'm a little bored, well, uh, that comes with the territory because I'm in a part of the cycle that requires you know, a, a, a long view because I'm going to have to keep doing this for a while, okay? Because it's a cycle, we should always be prepared for change and learn to be flexible in order to accommodate the various phases in the life of a congregation. Uh, lesson number two, know where you are in the cycle. For example, a church with empty pews shouldn't waste its time with a building program. A church with crowded classrooms needs both a building program and a teacher training program. Uh, wise leaders learn to discern where the congregation is in the cycle and plan for the next phase. That's the main work of, of the leaders. This breeds confidence in their leadership and clear directions for the congregation. You know, I believe most church uh, members want to be part of a healthy growing church, but they don't really understand the mechanics of church growth. It's very much like cars, you know, we know how to drive them. We even know something might be wrong with them. Maybe we can change a flat, you know, or change the oil, but we really don't know how to, you know, if the transmission is broken or something like that, we really don't know how the car works on the inside in order to uh, repair it. And it's the same with church growth. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you understand how the church grows. Uh, just because uh, you're a member of the church and you know the Bible doesn't necessarily mean you understand the cycle of growth and how to discern where a certain church is in the cycle. You know, I, I'm not a fan of teachers or preachers who have a system or a formula to you know, fix our brotherhood. You know, one, 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 you know, one size fits all, just do this and all the brotherhood will be fixed. I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. I, I, I don't hold uh, those who push this scenario uh, in high uh, esteem. Uh, I don't believe that there is a one size fits all solution to fix what is broken in American churches or churches in other countries for that matter. The fact that the New Testament pattern for church organization suggests that each congregation is autonomous with its own individual leadership, this tells me that solutions to church problems like apathy or lack of growth and other issues should be solved at the congregational level as well. The, the pattern, the cycle is similar everywhere. Uh, but different churches are at different places in the cycle. And so problems in local churches should be handled uh, locally. Now, the most common problem that I see in the church is excessive worldliness. And this is the cause of spiritual dryness and discouragement and lack of commitment to spiritual things. These problems are not new. Paul battled these things in both Ephesus and Corinth, and Jesus warned the seven churches in the book of Revelation about these very same issues. Each congregation needs to examine itself and see where their deficiency lies, in the planting, in the watering, or in the harvesting. Just as the farming cycle has not changed in thousands of years, so too has the church continued in its seeding and watering and harvesting. The problem as well as the solution is always found and connected with the cycle. When you examine the cycle, you, you often find where the problem is for that particular local church. All right, the third one, practical lesson, church work and growth is cyclical, 
know where you are in the cycle. And the third one, Jesus is the Lord of every harvest. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 9, Paul says the following, So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So Paul uh, explains the cycle in his own way. He reminds his readers that no matter where we are in the cycle and what task has been assigned to us, the Lord is the one who will cause the seed to grow. Very important, very important to remember that. The Lord is the one who will cause the seed to grow. Then Paul reassures them that each point in the cycle, each task performed is the same in God's eyes. Seed planters have no greater glory than waterers or harvesters. They are all equal tasks in God's eyes. And he will reward based on how you worked, not what you worked at in the cycle. For example, if you served well keeping the nursery, you will be rewarded. If you neglected your responsibility as an elder, you will receive your due. Finally, in verse nine, Paul explains that while you are busy working at your ministry, whatever that is, at whatever point in the cycle, God is busy working on you. Your theater of operation is this world and the task is to fill it with the knowledge of Christ. His theater of operation is your heart and his task is to fill it with the love of Christ through the Holy Spirit. As I close, I want to remind you that as you work to bring Jesus to the world, he is at work preparing you for the world to come. And this is also part of the cycle. All right, well, that's our class on farming in the kingdom of God. Hope you uh, have received a couple of ideas, a couple of good ideas to help you in your, uh, in your ministry. And uh, we have one more class uh, to go and I'll see you next time we are together for the final class in our series, uh, The Kingdom of God is Like. And hopefully you've gotten some better ideas about what the kingdom of God is really like. All right, thanks for your attention. We'll see you next time.